Thank you so much for everyone coming. What a nice day today, instead of that. So when uh, my good friend Sanjot Mehendali asked me to introduce today's guest speaker, I accepted it with great pleasure because Professor Shoren Stark is a dear friend. He's an excellent scholar and a reputed archaeologist. I am aware of his work because his area of research, I mean Bronze Age, Hellenis Hellenism and post-Hellenism in Central Asia, are of great interest to me as well as to Sanjot. We all have started our research in this field in Central Asia before we move towards South and East. This is what's happening today with the Silk Road program. Um, Shoran Stark is Associate Professor of Central Asian Art and Archaeology at the New York University Institute for the Study of the Asian World. He received his PhD in 2005 from Martin Luther University in Halle under Moder, one of our again, one of one of our best friends. And you came here 2005, right, to Berkeley to look at the Soviet maps, yes. right, <laughs> which are now digitized. Um, before joining the faculty, uh, faculty of the ISO, he was junior fellow at the uh, Excellence Cluster Topoi and teaching at the Free University in Berlin. Uh, Professor Stark has two, uh, two decades of experience in conducting uh, directly archaeological field work in Central Asia. Between 2005 and 2007, he conducted and co-directed archaeological surveys and excavations in northern Tajikistan on bronze and Iron Age uh, petroglyphs, Iron Age Kurgans, and uh, uh, Samanid and Karkanid period mountain settlements. From 2011 to 2015, he uh, co-directed surveys and excavations at various monuments related with the oasis of Bukhara. His today's talk on the life at the border, the farmers and nomads at the edge of the Bukhara oasis during antiquity is partly based on his fieldwork. Since 2015, he is co-directing an archaeological field project investigating, investigating agro-pastoral groups in Western Sogdiana during the Hellenistic and post-Hellenistic periods, centered on excavations and desert sites of um, Bashtepe. I have already listened to his talk at Collège de France on this subject and read his publications, which have added much knowledge to the research so far conducted by our Uzbek, Rus Soviet and Russian, and French colleagues. Uh, Professor Stark's current uh, research interests are, among others, on Hellenistic and late antiquity, early medieval Sogdiana, and the archaeology and history of nomadic groups close to overseas territories in Western Central Asia. His publications include a monograph on the archaeology of the 6th to 8th century Turks in Inner and Central Asia, an exhibition catalogue on uh, early Iron Age Kurgans from uh, uh, Kazakhstan, and numerous articles and book chapters on the history and being co-director of the Journal of the Inner Asian Art and Archaeology at Brepols. He's, he's currently preparing a book, I don't know whether you have uh, finished it, on uh, territorial fortifications in Western Central Asia, and he's also co-director of a handbook of Central Asian Archaeology and Art in preparation for the Oxford University Press. Hope it is not yet finished, right? You are working on it, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, as, as we know, the oasis of Bukhara was a major nod in the network of ancient and medieval communications lines across Euro-Asia, located at an important crossroads where routes between eastern Iran and Samarkand met with routes which ran between Bactra, Bactria, Tokaristan, and India and Lake Aral, and further on to the Eastern Europe. We are fortunate to learn uh, more about the archaeological and historical studies on this uh, region based on the results of his ongoing fieldwork at number of sites in the ancient border zone of Bukhara oasis during the Hellenistic and Proto-Hellenistic period. It is my great pleasure to welcome dear Shoren uh, on behalf of the Y and King May y Tanks, uh, y w Tank Center for Silk Road Studies of the University of California, Berkeley, and invite you to address the gathering. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Osman, for this very, very kind um, 
introduction. I'm not sure whether it's uh, deserved. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, Sancho. I'm um, deeply grateful to be here and uh, to learn more about uh, uh, your project and uh, what you're doing here in uh, 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 your project. My talk will take you to uh, Western Central Asia, more specifically, as uh, uh, Osmond indicated, to the oasis region of Bukhara, as uh, Osmond said, one of the major nodes of within this network of ancient and medieval communication lines that uh, cross Eurasia and that are uh, generally these days known as the Silk Roads. And my talk will also take you all the way back to the period of antiquity. Now our understanding of uh, Western Central Asia during antiquity is very much shaped by two concepts. On the one hand, our concept of the phenomenon of the Hellenism in the East, as it is often called, um, as a consequence of Alexander's and uh, slightly later Seleucid's conquest of the wider region. And on the other hand, it is the concept of the Silk Road itself. Both concepts have one thing in common, and that is a very heavy focus on cities, on city life, in all its various manifestations. Much less scholarly attention received those who sustained cities, who complemented uh, urban centers, living in the rural hinterland, in the rural countryside, and even beyond in the extensive uh, desert steppes beyond the uh, irrigation oasis. And this is what I would like to do in my talk today um, on the basis of fresh results from ongoing fieldwork. I would like to have a closer look at farming and pastoral uh, communities and their life at the border of the oasis of Bukhara, um, far away, but as you will see, still connected with the centers of Greek and Macedonian rule and presence in Central Asia. And this brings me to the region my talk is uh, focused on, the oasis of Bukhara in the historical region of Sogdiana. Um, Bukhara and its uh, rural hinterland are situated in the delta area of the Serafshan River. Um, uh, one of the two large rivers that uh, sort of form um, the historical region of Sogdiana. You see that the various arms of the river delta form the basis of uh, a fertile irrigation oasis, approximately close to 4,000 square kilometers in size, which stands in very stark contrast to uh, the surrounding desert and desert steppe. I've mentioned that uh, this region was a major knot uh, in this Silk Road network, and indeed, as uh, um, Osmond indicated already, it uh, was uh, located at an important crossroads where uh, several important um, sort of corridors of communications intersected, uh, routes coming from the south, from Bactria to Kharistan, ultimately all the way from India, um, that met with important corridors that went more in an east-west direction between Marv and the Iranian Plateau and uh, Samarkand, the so-called um, King's Road, um, uh, meeting routes that went further to the north, to Khorasan, to Lake Aral, all the way up to Eastern Europe, or to the lower and the middle Siodaria, where they then connected with uh, corridors of communication in the Eurasian steppe zone. Yeah, so a very vibrant, very important crossroads. Um, the wider region of Bukhara is archaeologically very rich, as you can see. We know today way, way above 1,000 sites, um, all kinds of sites, settlements, uh, burial uh, uh, grounds, um, fortifications, um, they go back all the way to uh, the early Bronze Age. However, only a very small percentage of uh, uh, this number of sites has been explored in a, a really systematic uh, way. 
So the goal of my collaboration with uh, Jamal Mirza Ahmedov from the Archaeological Institute at the Uzbek Academy of Sciences, which started in 2011 and which was joined by Fiona Kitt uh, from NYU Abu Dhabi in 2015, is to improve this situation, especially uh, for the periods of antiquity and the early Middle Ages, so roughly for uh, the centuries between the 3rd century BCE and, let's say, the 10th century CE. Um, the first, the earlier phase of uh, our joint project was focused on the investigation of uh, the late antique, early medieval outer fortification system of the oasis, an impressive complex of fortifications consisting of a, uh, an oasis wall, a 200 miles long uh, wall, continuous wall encircling the entire oasis, complete with some uh, 60 fortresses, forts, watchtowers, fortified gates, um, which dates the two phases between the 4th century and the uh, 8th and 9th century CE, so late antiquity and the early uh, Middle Ages. I don't want to go further into this because uh, today I will deal only with the results of our second uh, project phase, um, initiated in 2015, uh, together with uh, my colleague Fiona Kitt, which aims at the exploration of Hellenistic and early post-Hellenistic sites in the region of Bukhara. Now, during both project phases, uh, our work has not been on the centers of uh, the oasis region of Bukhara, such as the famous city of Bukhara itself. Um, the reason for this is that sites, of, uh, sites in this central area of the oasis are usually covered with many, many meters of cultural layers dating to later, to the Islamic Middle Ages, to the late Islamic Middle Ages, very often the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Uh, strata dating to antiquity have been reached only uh, within very, very limited stratigraphic, stratigraphic uh, sondages, so that until now we basically don't know next to nothing uh, about the Hellenistic period uh, in terms of its archaeology uh, uh, in Bukharan Sogdiana. That's in contrast to other regions, other micro-regions in Sogdiana, such as Samarkand, Afrasiyab, or Yakogan uh, in the Nakhshab area. Um, so our work has been deliberately focused on the, what were the old fringes of the oasis, where substantial layers dating to later periods are usually missing, and where layers dating to antiquity, the, cent the centuries around the turn of our era, can often be found right on the present day surface. So let's finally go uh, to our current area of investigation. Um, you see that here um, um, encircled in red uh, with the uh, uh, enlarged map here in the left right corner, um, the lower right corner. Um, it's an area, it's not big, it's an area of about eight square miles, about 30 miles to the uh, northwest of the modern city of Bukhara. And you can see that already it's outside of the present day oasis territory. Yeah. So uh, today it is actually, um, you see if you get that started, yeah. Today it is situated already deep in the uh, Kisselkum Desert, um, in the midst of shifting sand dunes and Saksaul bushes. It's a perfectly flat landscape up to the horizon. And the only elevations that you see here are man-made. About, do about a dozen of them, these small hills called Tepa in Tachik and Uzbek. They represent the remains of small fortified or non-fortified settlements, hamlets, farmsteads. Um, they now appear as isolated uh, dots in the landscape, but they were once surrounded by production areas, by gardens, by fields, by uh, 
So they formed a continuous zone of habitation, cultivation, and production. The largest of these sites here is the hill of Bashtepa, meaning literally head hill. So probably because it was the westernmost one and the first hill that was seen by travelers coming from the desert when they approached the oasis. So this area here was when the site of Bashtepa functioned, the old border of the oasis. Now, this all looks like a magnificent and uh, a majestic landscape um, during uh, early sunrise, but uh, I can assure you it is less inviting uh, around noon in the months of uh, July and August when we usually are forced to work because of the American academic schedule. Um, uh, also, this area, this old cluster of sites is not very easy to reach. So that might be one of the reasons why these sites, this cluster of about a dozen relatively small sites far out in the desert, relatively removed from Bukhara, has been known since a very long time, since the 30s when the archaeological exploration of that area started, the days of Shishkin, Vasily Shishkin. Um, but because of the logistic difficulties uh, um, and of course also because of the at attractiveness of the big city centers closer by in the centers of the oasis, um, none of these sites has ever really studied systematically over a prolonged period of time and that's what we are doing. Um, there are a number of difficulties that uh, um, have to be taken into account when you are uh, working in these sites, but these difficulties also have a great payoff. Um, and the great payoff of this is that ever since the end of permanent settlement in this particular area, which is now desert, uh, it remained in principle untouched by later settlements, land developments, which took place on a large and massive scale, especially in the Middle Ages, inside the oasis. So this landscape remained undisturbed from all of this. Uh, so we are dealing with a relic landscape dating back to antiquity here. Um, back to the time when this area formed, as I said, uh, the border zone of the delta of the Serafshan River. And you see the uh, old features, the geographical, topographic features inscribed in that landscape as, it, as they were, as they existed back 2000, 2300 years ago. Some of the old river arms here uh, and terminal branches of the Serafshan River are still clearly visible uh, in the landscape, um, indicating uh, a landscape probably similar to this, extensive Tugai forests, which were and to some degree still are characteristic for many delta areas in the wider region. But what we also find right on the surface are extensive field systems right next to the settlements. So obviously this very nicely preserved relic landscape practically undisturbed since antiquity, featuring sites uh, with Hellenistic and early post-Hellenistic layers basically right on the surface, um, offer unique opportunities to study the complexities of uh, this part of the rural countryside of Sogdiana during antiquity. And for a start, one really needs to look only uh, closely at the present day surface to get information about um, this uh, society, uh, this rural society in antiquity. Um, and if you look closely at the surface, you already discern interesting details, such as various kinds of uh, irrigation techniques, ranging from you know, very simple um, irrigation techniques involving only little dams as field borders which are subsequently opened one after the, after the other and providing water this way, um, contrasting with much more sophisticated irrigation techniques that uh, involve a multitude of small terminal canals that feed 
individual field plots. Many of these relic fields were apparently used to, to grow grain, as this landscape is literally littered by thousands of grinding fragments of grinding stones and millstones. Um, but of course, much more information can be obtained uh, by stratigraphic excavation. And as I've mentioned earlier, um, here in the present day desert, Hellenistic and early post-Hellenistic archeological assemblages appear right on the surface, ready for investigation. And for this purpose, uh, we've chosen the site of Bashtepa. Um, as I said, it is the westernmost of this small site cluster. Um, it's also the largest one, but this uh, um, has to be taken in relative term. It's still a relatively small uh, site of only about half a hectare in size. So these are all very, very uh, small sites. Um, and of course, after only three field seasons in uh, 2000, excavation seasons in 2016, 17, and 18, uh, this uh, past summer we did a study season, uh, so we did not continue excavations, we will continue in the next summer. Um, um, only, after only three seasons, we are still at a preliminary uh, stage of our investigation, but we are beginning to understand the broad outlines of the development of this particular site. Don't worry, I don't want to go too much uh, into detail, um, but it seems that at the beginning, the site was originally founded as a kind of a border fortress with uh, what seems like an inner donjon, keep, uh, surrounded by an outer fortification. Um, we know um, that these outer fortification developed over uh, at least three stages um, until during the last construction phase, um, they were at its base about eight meters wide, so quite massive, quite uh, impressive military architecture, pointing to the strategic importance um, of this uh, fortress at the border of the oasis on what was the main the most direct route to Chorism. Yeah. Um, we can be certain now that the site was founded at some point in the third century BCE. Um, the dating results on um, three observations. First, a series of radiocarbon dates from floor levels associated with the uh, original fortress. Uh, the central area at the site in uh, a, a deep uh, sounding. The second observation that comes in here is uh, that already the early phase, the earliest phase of the uh, outer fortifications uh, used consistently uh, square mud bricks, very regular 40 to 40 centimeters, about 10, 12 centimeters high. It's the so-called pentadoron. It's a type of brick that comes in this region really only in the early Hellenistic period with the Seleucids. Yeah. Um, and we know that from other sites um, as well. Um, um, for instance, Afrasiab, uh, but also from uh, uh, Giaorkala uh, in Margiana, um, which is uh, Antiochia in Margiana. And the third observation is that uh, we completely lack Yas three ceramics at that site, anywhere. We, we didn't come across a single shirt of Yas three ceramics, and Yas three ceramics, for those of us who don't know, it's uh, uh, the type of ceramic that is in this region usually associated with the Achaemenid period. It continues a little bit into the very, very early Hellenistic period. Um, so this site does not date into the uh, Achaemenid period. We have no Yastri ceramics whatsoever. Um, so we're certain that it was founded at some point in the third century. What we are not so certain of is which half of the uh, third century, first half or second half of the uh, third century. And that would be actually quite important to know um, if uh, the fortress happened to be founded in the first half of the third century, um, it 
would have in all likelihood, likelihood represent a Seleucid foundation. And as such, it would fit well into the picture of a very active frontier policy carried out by Antiochus during his co-regency in the upper stretch uh, satrapies between uh, 2090, uh, 294 and uh, 281, when he was vice king of the upper um, satrapies. Um, but we have, at this point, uh, no means to ascertain that. It, as I said, it would fit nicely into the picture because it's possible that exactly during this period a number of other sites in the region were actually founded, probably also as strongholds, and probably founded as strongholds securing major communication lines. First of all, the one between Antiochia and Margiana, I just mentioned that here, uh, the capital site or the metropolitan site of uh, the Murgab oasis, Margiana, and Afrasiab, Marakanda, Samarkand in, uh, uh, in Sogdiana. Um, and with the founding of the uh, colony of Antiochia and Margiana in the early Seleucid period, um, this must have become a very important and the most direct uh, communication line with uh, Margiana. And in that respect, the Serafshan Delta must have gained in importance. And uh, uh, it seems that a number of sites uh, appear here right along this stretch, um, including possibly Bashtepa, which would have secured an offshot here uh, to Khorasan. However this may be, at some point after the 3rd century BCE, this original fortress seemed to have gradually developed into a rural settlement. Um, perhaps at least at the beginning still associated with a military garrison. At this point of our research we can trace only the latest phase of this develop, development with some confidence, namely in form of uh, a dense cluster of pit houses right on, right beneath the present day surface. These are uh, pit houses that we have um, opened uh, in our trenches already, but just by cleaning the surface of the site, you can see many more here uh, covering essentially the entire uh, surface of um, the site of Pashtepa. And we know that these pit houses stayed roughly between the second half of the um, second century BCE and the very end of the first century CE, maybe the very beginning of the second century CE. That is mostly, uh, this is mostly based on uh, radiocarbon dates again. But, and that's important uh, for what I'm going to talk about in the following. Before these pit houses were built, a substantial package of waste deposits of, in some areas, several meters thickness accumulated in the central part of the site. This is the uh, parts where we have uh, uh, encountered, opened uh, these uh, waste deposits in our trenches, but we can assume that they were basically everywhere here in uh, the southern part of the site. They might stem from some structure that might have once stood on a platform here in the northern part of the site, but of which unfortunately nothing remains. So we cannot be sure whether there was some sort of building standing on this platform or whether there was no building on that platform. We only have this platform that we don't really understand at this point. But these waste deposits, they seem to have been thrown off from this platform. Um, however this may be, it is actually these waste deposits which are kind of our wonder house in Bashtepa. For a start, they give us a very uh, clear picture of what was grown 
and what was consumed at this site, roughly dating from dating uh, roughly during the second uh, and the first centuries uh, uh, BCE. This is uh, the date of these uh, waste deposits. First, there's evidence of meat, a lot of meat. In 2018 alone, we recovered well over 150 pounds of animal bones, both of uh, domesticated and of wild species, pointing to meat consumption on a surprisingly massive scale at this rather uh, small site. Animal husbandry and hunting must have played an important role uh, at this site. In addition, our seed record, which is investigated uh, by Robert Spengler uh, and his team at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena in Germany, shows that the inhabitants of Bashteba also consumed free threshing wheat, that is highly, a highly compact variety as well as a lax-eared variety, hulled six-road barley, possibly also two-road barley, broom corn millet, foxtail millet, grass peas, and lentils. So this is what we have in our record so far, but the work is uh, ongoing. So the fields that I've showed at the beginning or earlier, um, these were prob most probably, uh, for the most part, wheat and barley fields. All of this was apparently washed down by generous portions of wine. Uh, we have a lot of wine grapes in, uh, in, our, in our record um, and in, in our flotation samples. Um, and this may serve as a reminder that wine consumption, uh, often excessively practiced, has a very deep root in the feasting culture of the greater Iranian world to which the ancient inhabitants of Bashteba belonged in one way or the other. Somewhat more surprising uh, in our flotation samples, especially if one's gaze wanders across this landscape covered by uh, sand dunes all the way up to the horizons, are fish bones. We have a lot of fish bones in uh, our flotation samples. Um, fish of all kinds from very small, sort of anchovy-like species to large carps, it's all there. Uh, so fish must have been a fixture on the dinner table at Bashtepa. This is, again, a clear indication that uh, the ancient settlement was once surrounded by a landscape that must have looked very, very different uh, than it looks uh, today, full of lakes, ponds, meandering river arms. And finally, by, again, very carefully uh, floating samples, soil samples, we detected that the waste deposits at Bashtepa are also full of highly fragmented eggshells. Um, now the question is what kind of eggshells these are. <laughs> Robert Spengler is currently trying to determine uh, if uh, these are actually really chicken eggs. We're not sure. But if they are chicken eggs, uh, that would have been one of the earliest examples of uh, chicken eggs in Central Asia. Um, so here comes in one of our favorite uh, breakfast stables. Um, so it appears that the inhabitants of Bashtepa and uh, the somewhat smaller sites around were engaged in fairly complex strategies of food production and fruit procurement. In addition to agropastoralism, they were avid hunters and fishermen, as well as maybe early chicken farmers. Apparently, they were perfectly adapted to this once marshy and, by all appearances, once very well-watered delta landscape. But were they also isolated in these seemingly peripheral marshlands? In fact, the same waste deposits give us some really interesting glimpses that the inhabitants of this small border settlement in the marshlands of the Serafshan Delta were actually surprisingly well connected with the outside world during the second and the first centuries BCE. And with this, I would like to draw your attention to uh, our ceramic complex that was found together with 
the bones and the seeds. And uh, this ceramic complex is uh, now by far the most substantial complex of Hellenistic and early post-Hellenistic ceramics from anywhere in Western Sogdiana. It's currently uh, studied in detail by my colleague and co-director of our project, Fiona Kitt, so I don't want to go too much uh, into detail, but there is one uh, curious group of ceramics that warrants uh, our uh, particular attention. And that's uh, a small group of fine tableware which uh, differs markedly from the rest of the ceramic assemblage at Bashtepa. Some of them are made of fine greyware. You can't see that here on the picture, but basically these... Oops. Wait. Uh, these here, these, this is very fine greyware. Um, we do have... Uh, fragments that uh, um, uh, feature incised and stemmed dot and triangle patterns. And most distinctively here, a group of mold-made hemispherical bowls, which is generally well known under the term of Megarian bowls. Uh, Know that these Megarian bowls, so-called Megarian bowls, circulated wildly in the Mediterranean and in the Pontic region in the second century and the first century BCE. Now, the presence of such mold-made bowls, and I show you a very nice example uh, from the Athenian Agora. Uh, the presence of such uh, mold-made bowls is, as far as I am aware, uh, unique in Sogdiana. We don't even find it, uh, find them in, on metropolitan sites, such as Afrasiab or in Yakogan. Um, however, it is well known that they appear in Bactria, most abundantly recorded at the famous site of Aichanum, the Greek city at the banks of the Oxus River in eastern Afghanistan. From here, circa 40 fragments of such bowls are known. And they are known from several other sites in Bactria. Um, the parallels between the fragment from Bashtepa, or the fragments from Bashtepa, here's one example, and those from Al Khanum are, I think, really remarkable, especially with regard to the somewhat degenerated decor compared to examples like the one that I've showed before from the Athenian Agora. In fact, we know that in Aichanum, these mold-made bowls were uh, uh, produced locally, as a mold was found in the main temple of the city. The same is in principle also possible for Bashtepa, but the completely isolated nature of this group of finds makes it, I think, rather unlikely. The possibility of a local production is even more unlikely with regard to the greyware uh, specimen that I've mentioned before, because they would require uh, acquaintance with specific technologies. Instead, I think we are dealing here with imports, namely from Bactria, maybe even from Eastern Bactria. Now, it is well known that these so-called Megarian bolts uh, are a very good chronological marker. Uh, they appear first in Athens, around 220 BCE, and they start to circulate outside of Attica towards the beginning of the second century BCE. In Aichanum, they appear only during the last phase of Greek rule over the city, that is the second quarter of the second century BCE. But by that time, Greek rule over Sogdiana, including Bashtepa, was long over. So, how to explain the presence of fine Craigobactrian tableware in these seemingly peripheral marshlands in Bukharan Sogdiana, by all accounts far away from the centers of Greek rule in Bactria. Um, to answer this question, I'd like to look first a little bit closer at other imports from Bactria into the Bukhara area. The largest group of such imports are 
one would expect, of course, coins. Um, up to now, nearly 70 coins have been found in the, Greek coins have been found in the Bukhara region. The majority of them, 58, come from a single hoard. That is the a hoard that was found in 1983 at the site of Pachmach Teba. Um, as pointed out by my colleague Alexander Neymark, the composition of the uh, Tachmach Teba hoard is identical with the composition of two contemporary hoards that were discovered during excavation in Eichanum. Now, as argued by Neymark, um, it is extremely unlikely that monetary circulation in far away, far away uh, Bukhara um, was exactly the same uh, as in Eichanum. Instead, it suggests that the Tachmach uh, Tepahort was brought in Toto from Greek Bactria and deposited in Bukhara, perhaps by a merchant. But it's also possible that this group was part of some indemnity money paid by the Greeks to their nomadic neighbors in the north. There's a clear predominance of Eutetimus tetradrachms in the horde. And in fact, we know that especially in the time of this king, so-called Scythian hordes, to the north of Bactria presented a considerable danger to Greek rule in Bactria and can assume that tribute and ransom payment uh, were paid to them. It's also quite possible that considerable numbers of these Scythians, whoever they are, served in the Greek army in Bactria as mercenaries, something that happened all the time throughout history in these regions. And they must have been paid. This is perhaps suggested by a recently published Greek parchment from Afghanistan. Uh, although it's very fragmentary and one can read a lot of things into it. Uh, now, we don't know where these Scythians uh, in the north exactly came from, but what we know is that at around the same time, the periphery of the oasis of Bukhara, especially the... What happened here? Especially the eastern and northeastern fringes where we have very rich winter pasture grounds were used for extensive nomadic burial grounds. It's essentially one continuous funerary zone littered with well over 1,000 kurgan tumuli. Um, these kurgans are currently uh, restudied together with new excavations by uh, my doctoral student, uh, Shu Ching Wang, who knows much more about these Kogans that uh, I do at this point. Um, she will defend uh, her dissertation on uh, these Kogans uh, next spring, and um, she will bring a lot of interesting new data and observations uh, about these Kogans to the table, including a much more refined chronology. Um, we don't have to go too much into detail here, but what is of interest for our context is that, indeed, in some of these Kogans, imports from Bactria were found. Um, it's not that many, but they exist. Um, uh, we find them in form of uh, furniture, uh, um, um, pieces, jewelry, and probably most spectacular, a silver coin of the last ruler of Bactria, Heliocles I. So, the appearance of fine tableware from Bactria at the border fortress of Bashtepa, seemingly in the middle of nowhere of uh, the Hellenistic world, might have something to do with local nomadic groups, or more precisely, with nomadic warbands operating in the wider region all the way down south in Bactria. In fact, such a combination of imports of goods that are considered to be uh, um, exotic, prestigious if you want, uh, by uh, 
warriors, by merchants. It's uh, something that is not new at all. Those who study, uh, for instance, Germanic elites in, uh, uh, during the early imperial period in uh, um, Central and Northern Europe might be reminded of the uh, 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 frequent finds of terra sigillata um, um, vessels in burials of returned Germanic veterans of the Roman army all the way up to southern Scandinavia. Perhaps a garrison of such Scythians, or I should at this point rather say Saka uh, tribesmen, was stationed at Bashtepa in the second uh, and early first century CE. After all, still in the 19th century, in the very same region, um, border garrisons were usually stuffed by nomads. In the, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, usually Turkmen tribesmen. Um, it's a recurrent phenomenon. This could also be the reason why we found, again, in the same waste deposit, so this waste deposit basically uh, provided us with 90% uh, of our small finds. In the same waste deposit, we also found a very nice belt buckle, which again has very close analogies in contemporary kurgans from the Bukhara area. Um, of course, further work at Bashteba and its surroundings is needed in order to better understand all these uh, complexities. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear already that systematic study of Hellenistic and post-Hellenistic rural landscapes far away from the centers of Greek rule and colonization in Central Asia has the potential to um, offer at least unexpected insights and enriches the discussion of the phenomenon of Hellenism in the East. And it also shows that the seemingly small world of uh, these agro-pastoral communities at the edges of the ancient river oases was nonetheless well connected with the bigger world of the ancient Silk Roads. Thank you for your attention.